Welcome everyone uh, to this webinar on natural history and visual arts from the margins, uh, which has been organized with um, Julie Kim of Fordham University and a very well, warm welcome to Julie, who has had to wake up at an ungodly hour this morning to join us uh, from the United States. Um, and I'm Isabel Charmontier, I'm the head of collections at the Linnean Society. And with us today, also from the Linnean Society, is uh, Padma Ghosh, who's our events and communications manager, and who will be managing everything behind the scenes. Um, so just to say that from the program, we've merged the welcome and introductions that are quite separate on the program. Initially, this event was meant to be on site in Burlington House on Piccadilly at the Linnean Society. Um, so this is something that uh, is now that we have gone uh, uh, digital uh, and virtual, um, we, we probably won't need the, the entire 30 minutes we had planned for both the welcome and introduction. So I will start saying a few words, introducing the Linnean Society and our collections, which really were the inspiration for today's meeting. And then I will pass over to Julie, who will expand on, on the day's themes before we get into the first session. Um, so first, just a short introduction to the Linnean Society for those of you who do not know who we are and what we do. We're a learned society. We're situated in Burlington Courtyard on Piccadilly, along with various other learned societies um, and the Royal Academy of Arts. Um, and we are currently open, I should say. <laughs> um, so the, the aims of the Learned Society is to inform, involve and inspire people about nature and its significance through our collections, our programs and publications. And we do have uh, a, a very full program of events that you can uh, look for online. The Linnean Society was founded in 1788 to house the collections of the Swedish naturalist Carl Linnaeus. Uh, and these collections were bought by our founder, James Edward Smith at Linnaeus's death. And these collections are still in our keeping. And I'm trying to change the slide and for some reason, my computer, oh, here we go. Uh, so th th these are the Linnean collections which are in our, in our collection store in the basement on, on Piccadilly. Uh, and they include Linnaeus's books, his manuscript, his correspondence and his biological specimens of plants, uh, fish, shells and insects. And you can also browse through them online um, as they have mostly all been digitized along with other various archives. And over the years, the society has acquired the archives of uh, quite a number of its fellows, all men until women were allowed to become fellows in 1904. And so as such, we have a rich archive of material describing the natural history of Britain, but also the British colonial world from the West Indies to India. And these archives, include uh, manuscripts, but also a lot of artworks, and they can be searched using our online archive catalog, which is here, <coughs> excuse me. So this day meeting really stems directly from these archival collections and from the uh, archives cataloging program that is currently underway because a lot of our archives have not been cataloged um, uh, by contracts to the, the books in the library, which are, have all been cataloged. Uh, and we've had a, a, an archives cataloging program underway for the last, um, I'd say, five or six years. And the society holds a number of artworks, many of which were commissioned by naturalists in the field in the 18th and 19th century. So these artworks either accompanied manuscripts and notebooks, which came to be deposited at the Linnean Society by, by the fellows themselves. But more often, these artworks were sent with what we call uh, the society papers, uh, and these are the papers that were sent to be read at meetings of the Linnean Society. And these, these drawings would have been exhibited uh, on the meeting room desk, which we can see in this painting commemorating the admission of the first women fellows in 1905. And the desk has a ledge, which here you can see is being used to display um, uh, specimens in jars, but which would have been used also to display any artworks that were sent with the manuscripts that were being read at meetings of the society and the the desk itself is still in our meeting room uh, and you can see it if you ever visit the Linnean Society. These artworks were often not produced by the naturalist writing the article to be read and published at the Linnean Society, rather they employed local uh, or indigenous artists to draw or paint 
the plants and animals they were writing about. Uh, yet in most cases, the identities of these artists are unknown, although current research, uh, I'm happy to say, is making headways into uncovering who these artists were. So I just want to show you a few examples of uh, the, the kind of artworks that really um, incited, uh, incited us to, to, um, to organize such an event that would highlight these unknown artists. Um, the first are from um, the Thomas Hardwick collection. Uh, Major General Thomas Hardwick was a soldier in the British East India Company, and he submitted quite a number of papers to scientific society in both Calcutta and London. And he, in the course of his career, he amassed an important collection on over 4,000 paintings of animals and plants. Uh, we've got uh, a, hand, a few, uh, a lot of these are also at the Natural History Museum. Um, Hardwick sent 22 papers to the society to be read at meetings between 1804 and 1827. And just two examples here. This one um, was read in November, eight, no, sorry, it was sent in November 1821. And it depicts a red panda, which is probably the first illustration of a red panda to reach uh, Europe. Unfortunately for Hardwick, uh, this paper was read much later, which means that in the meantime, Cuvier in France, <coughs> excuse me, uh, had um, uh, published a paper uh, identifying and describing the red panda and was able to give it its name. The other um, striking uh, illustrations that we have from Hardwick is that of reticulated uh, python, a paper that was read in March, 1823. And in, in all of these cases, the artist is entirely unknown and unnamed. Another example is the Reverend William Carey, who sent 35 watercolor drawings to uh, the Linnean Society in 1828 from Bengal. And the plates uh, uh, either show the life cycle of various insects with their host plants, as here on the left, uh, while others show crop plants such as jute, um, mustard and taro with their associated pests. And again, the artist is unknown. I'm very sorry, I'm going to have to have a drink. The back to school cold. <laughs> uh, another example is Francis Buchanan Hamilton, shown here, uh, who also worked for the East India Company as a surgeon and statistical surveyor. And be, uh, he, was, he spent some time in Nepal, Bengal, and uh, Mysore. And in this case, we do know that he hired an artist in Bengal by the name of Haludar. And he is probably the author of a number of the botanical artworks in our collection. What is very interesting about the Buchanan, Hamilton, and Haludar collections is that they go hand in hand with the specimens that we also have uh, uh, in our collections. Um, so we have here a species of orchid collected in Upper Nepal in 1802. Uh, and then another uh, specimen of orchid, oh, something's gone very wrong with my text. I'm very sorry about this. Um, it's a species of orchid as well. And in this case, we have the specimen on the left, uh, Haludar's painting, if it is Haludar on, on, in the center, and then the uh, engraving uh, as this was published by James Edward Smith in his Exotic Botany of, um, I think it's 1806. I don't have the text under my eyes here because it's all been scrambled. Um, Haludar was recently one of the subjects of the Wallace Collection's magnificent exhibition, Forgotten Masters, back in 2019. I think it was just before lockdown. And uh, this morning, Malini Roy's talk will be uh, on Haludar, so I won't say much more. And my final example, is that of John Tiley, who signed a number of botanical drawings that, and paintings that he did for the superintendent of the St. Vincent Botanical Garden, Alexander Anderson. So this is West Indies. And um, there's a few here. Um, and again, I won't say too much because uh, we'll have two talks this afternoon on uh, John Tiley. We'll explore much more this Afro-Caribbean artist. Um, but this is some of the 11 signed artworks that we have in the Linnean Society. And we were absolutely delighted to have recently acquired a new painting by John Tiley depicting the breadfruit tree. But I, I'll leave it at that. 
So for me, uh, as an archivist, it's, it's really vital to rediscover and to name these artists. Um, if it can be done, of course. Uh, from a very practical point of view, uh, their names as creator of the artworks should be the ones filling the creative field in an archives catalogue, not the name of a collector. <clears throat> so uh, here, this is something that we've been able to do in the case of the John Tiley manuscripts that have recently been catalogued um, uh, in our um, cataloging of all the Al Alexander Anderson uh, manuscripts. So this is a very practical point that may seem like a minor one, but in fact, it is an important step in restoring these artists to their rightful place in the historical account. And like many museums, the society is committed to the decolonization of its collections. And by decolonization, we don't simply mean the relocation of a statue or an object. For us, it's, it's more about the long-term process that seeks to recognize the integral role of empire in the building of collections uh, such as the Linnaean societies from the creation of these collections to the present day, and also to recognize the colonial structures that enable naturalists of the 18th and 19th century to carry out their work. And refocusing our attention on the artists, which enable the expansion of knowledge of the natural world within a colonial framework is a way, I think, to decolonize these collections. So before I pass on to Julie to expand on the themes and rationale uh, behind our meeting today, I, I just want to um, highlight two things. Um, first of all, that um, as I said at the beginning, the Linnean Society is open and we welcome everyone to our library on Piccadilly. So you do not have to be a fellow to research our collections and, uh, and we, um, we very much look forward to uh, um, welcoming more historians of science to work on our collections. And also, I wanted to thank uh, all the panelists, but also first and foremost, Julie, uh, for such an enjoyable and fruitful collaboration, which I think has been ongoing throughout lockdown, uh, really, and, and started when, um, when we met at a conference in Edinburgh about two years ago, was it? Two, three years ago. Um, and it, for me, her, your academic perspective brings really depth and significance to, uh, to my work and our collaboration. I'm really hugely grateful for it. So I'll pass over to you and I'll stop sharing, I think. Thank you so much, Isabel. And I wanted to start by saying thank you to you and the Linnaean Society for being so generous with your time and resources and for sharing so much of your knowledge and collections with me. I mean, I really have found so much inspiration for my own research and work from the Linnaean Society. Uh, you know, since the first time I set foot in the Linnaean, in the Linnaean Society about 11 years ago, um, it was a very memorable moment, um, as I'll talk about later. Um, but yes, I wanted to just speak very briefly about why we organized this meeting and you know the idea really did come as Isabel already said from the richness of the archival collections at the Linnaean Society all of these um, illustrations of animals and plants that are in the collections it also came though from a desire to understand the diverse agents who contributed to natural history in the 18th century, and indeed who laid the foundation for natural history with their labor and knowledge. We uh, realized that art might be an especially good way to get at this wider range of participants for a couple of reasons. For one, art and uh, the creation of illustrations, of drawings, of paintings, um, of visual depictions. All of this was absolutely crucial to the production and dissemination of scientific knowledge in the 18th century imperial world. Um, second, uh, you know, as scholars, historians of science and others have um, increasingly been realizing and showing with their research, there were botanical artists, animal painters, um, 
other artists who were working uh, across um, ac across the globe in this time period from um, India to China to the Caribbean um, and creating these documents um, that ended up um, forming parts of larger projects of natural history. So we really want to recognize what these artists did for these projects to begin to account for that work. At the same time, we also, and I think this is really crucial and something that um, will emerge across the day, we also want to recognize that these artists had their own lives, histories, and contexts um, that extended well beyond those dictated by the parameters of imperial endeavors. That even as these artists and other agents of science participated in imperial projects, they may have been pursuing their own aims or, object or objectives. Um, and really understanding these, we think, is um, and understanding how they may have diverged from uh, imperial goals as well as contributed to them. Um, that is what's uh, that is crucial to understanding the the full meaning of colonial science, uh, to understanding what really happened within the parameters of colonial science, uh, as well as to decolonizing it. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Isabel. Thank you, uh, Julie. So just um, just before we start, just a few items of uh, housekeeping. Um, I just wanted to remind people of the program. So we've got three sessions, one this morning on uh, local geographies of visual natural history, uh, which will start as soon as, as, soon as I'm finished. Um, just to let um, everyone know that the third talk uh, by Josepha Richard uh, will be recorded. Uh, Josepha has recently had a baby, so she recorded her talk. So there won't be any Q&A for um, the third talk this morning. And then we'll break for lunch uh, from 12 to 1 before resuming with session two, uh, Black Lives and Botanical Illustration, uh, a tea break at 2.30 to 5, uh, and then session three, Decolonizing the Spaces of Natural History. Um, Padma has sent everyone the same link for the entire day because that was just simple. Uh, we would like to ask people to log off at lunch and during the break before coming back with the same link. This uh, will enable us to uh, make sure that uh, the, all the PowerPoint presentations work with the, with the speakers. So if you could just log off and then come back, uh, uh, that should work just fine. Um, what else? Uh, if you could use the uh, Q&As to ask questions during the sessions rather than the chat, that's help us for us uh, chairs uh, to uh, sift through the questions rather than having to check both the chat and the Q&A. So please use the Q&A box for any questions to ask to the speakers. Um, and you can also raise your hand if you wish to ask a question live and Padma will, um, will be able to unmute you for you to, to ask your question uh, live during the, the talk. And I think that's it. Um, it just, uh, just wanted to uh, thank actually Padma who's provided uh, a huge uh, support throughout uh, uh, to organize all this. We couldn't have done it without you Padma. So, so huge thanks. Padma is our, um, as I said, our event and comms uh, manager, and she does a, an absolutely brilliant job at organizing very, very interesting events for the Linnaean Society. So um, do tune in. So I think if I haven't missed anything, and Padma will let me know, um, I will pass over to you, Julie, to start with the first session. Thank you very much. Hello again. So yes, I'm very happy to start the first session. Uh, and we have uh, three talks, the third of which, as Isabel mentioned, is pre-recorded. And I'm, I'm going to just refer you to the program for the full biographies of our speakers in the interest of giving them more time to talk. Um, but I will, I will introduce each speaker by name. Um, so our first speaker today is Rebecca Earle from the University of Warwick.
Thank you very much. So should I begin and get going? Yes, please. That's, um, that's brilliant. Well, thank you so much. I'm just going to faff around for a minute, um, getting my PowerPoint going. And yes. Oh, and I, I should say that I will, you know, I will moderate the, the Q&A and, and help you with that. Great. Can you now see my, this is that working? Yes. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So, well, I, I won't, I won't take up um, everyone's time more than I need to, to say thank you, but I do really want to say thank you to the organizers for putting together this incredibly exciting looking program. I'm really looking forward to the rest of it and I'm very happy to be participating. It's a really wonderful um, intellectual exercise and the other speakers also are very exciting. I look forward to hearing them. So I want to talk about caster paintings uh, because ever since I first saw a caster painting, I have been fascinated by them. And those of you who are already familiar with this remarkable Spanish American artistic genre will probably share my sense of fascination with them. But in case you're not familiar with them, let me give you a very brief introduction. Casta paintings, as they're known today, it's a modern term, are a distinctive artistic genre that depicts groupings of imaginary families as you see here in this example, consisting of a man, a woman, and their child, each labeled with a little label. Um, I, mean, I guess, I don't know, can you, can you see my little cursor um, moving around? Each labeled with a label that classifies them according to their caste, or as we, we might possibly say, their, their race. And it's the existence of these painted in captions that is diagnostic of a caster painting. It's what makes a caster painting a caster painting. And most caster paintings come from Mexico or were produced in the 18th century. And individual paintings, such as the one that you see here, we usually form part of larger sets of paintings, of individual paintings, but which together made up a set of perhaps as many as 16 paintings by the same artist which illustrate combinations of different castes. So here we have a Spanish man and an indigenous woman and their child who's labeled here as a, as a mestizo. And so the paintings in the series that make up sets of Casta paintings usually show combinations of Spanish people, indigenous people, people who are labeled as black people, their offspring, and then multiple combinations of these offspring. So caster paintings, and maybe I've got another, um, here's an example of an unusual type that shows all of them as part of one single painting where you can see all of these different families are shown together. So caster paintings cataloged the human heterogeneity of Spain's New World Empire by organizing its inhabitants, the individuals into families and those families into larger series. And so as you, um, a typical set might have captions of this sort. So these are the sorts of captions you might get. I think these paintings are interesting to scholars for many reasons. One is that they very often show intimate scenes of domestic life, of the sort that we often dream of capturing in our research and which is um, often difficult to do, particularly in colonial Spanish America for a variety of reasons. They show interracial families, which were and, and are tremendously common in Spanish America and in many parts of the world, but which have left a really small trace in the artistic record. As one of my students um, put it to me, caster paintings show families that look like my own family. So I think, I mean, here we have another, just another example of a, of a caster painting. So there's several reasons that people have become interested in them. But I think another reason for the current scholarly interest in these paintings, which is very high at present, is their obvious connections to other sorts of enlightenment classification. Taxonomy and the creation of schema to classify the natural world lay at the heart of 18th century science. The century was, as Londa Schiebiger put it, the great age of classification. And the century saw the publication of innumerable works offering a better or a new system for classifying all sorts of things from chemical compounds to, to legal systems. And as regards natural history, the monumental work of the French naturalist, the Comte de Buffon was in essence an extended exercise in classification. 
and his multi-volume Histoire Naturelle offered an influential definition of the concept of species and proposed a system of organization. Um, but his was, as we know, only one of a range of general systems that aimed at organizing the natural world into a coherent taxonomy. So classification and the best system to employ were persistent preoccupations of scientists, government officials, many others during the 18th century. Well, Castor paintings too offer a system of classification, in this case of people. The paintings organize individuals into family groups and then structure these family groups into larger series. Again, here's another one of these ones that does it in a, um, a single painting, ostensibly offering a complete taxonomy of human diversity in Spanish America. And the diagnostic captions add a sense of scientific objectivity. Each caption states clearly that the painting illustrates the outcome of a sexual encounter between a man and a woman and the, um, classifies the outspring. So this element of classification, in other words, is really evident to us. And it seems pretty clear that it was evident to viewers at the time as well. The scanty 18th century comments on the paintings consistently comment on them as representing generations of intermarriages between Spaniards and Indians and other people. So in the remainder of this talk, what I'd like to do is to say a bit about what we can learn about 18th century systems of classification, which is to say 18th century systems of knowledge, natural history is one example, if we include caste paintings within our sets of sources. There's a lot to be said about this, but in the interest of time, I want to talk about just two features. I want to talk about the connections that these paintings posit between botany and race, and the ways in which caste paintings make interventions into debates about the unity of the human race in particular. So first of all, botany and race. One of the better researched aspects of Casta paintings is their tendency to depict fruits and vegetables alongside human being. Oh, hang on, I've managed to jump two sides. Here's an example. So you can, as you can see in this painting, for example, by a well-known Mexican artist, of the era, the people aren't the only things which are labeled. Here's the caption telling us that this is a black man and an indigenous woman, and it labels their child with a racial category. But you can also probably just about see that all of these items of tropical fruit are also bearing little labels down at the bottom. So the jicamas and the sapotes and the other fruits are labeled just like the people. And Here's another example where, again, showing everybody all in one single painting with the Virgin of Guadalupe at the top. But you can see that almost as large as the people down at the bottom, we have avocados, such as we just saw in the other picture, a whole variety of other fruits. And I don't think it's legible, but down here at the bottom, there's a whole legend labeling all of the different fruits and giving their names as well. And we have also know that in some cases, the same individuals commission Gasta paintings and paintings of local fruits. Well, a number of scholars have commented on the obvious parallels that this sets up between the classification of people and the classification of other natural productions. And the art historian Elona Katsu, who is probably the greatest interpreter of the caste genre, has written extensively on these parallels. She's commented that both the diversity of people and of fruits reveal the extent of God's glory and for this reason, both were collected in royal cabinets of natural history in Madrid and elsewhere. So Casta paintings, in other words, at times displayed, um, they were at times themselves displayed as objects of natural history in cabinets of natural history because the same systems of knowledge, the same systems of classification underpin both the science of man and botany. Indeed, the connections between botany and the science of man in the 18th century are acknowledged by the very metaphors that animated and that drew together botany and the science of man. Just as plants are improved by grafting, so too the American castes are improved by mixing, commented one observer in 1810. The similarity of the language used for classifying plants and classifying people is equally clear, for example, in the comments of the botanist Jose Queri Martinez, who was the first professor of botany 
at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Madrid, and it was the author of an admired treatise on botany and botanical classification. And in his 1762 Flora Española, he explained that natural history regularly produced what he called monstrous or hybrid beings, but these bastard varieties, as he called them, could often be returned to their original form, he argued. Bastard varieties of plant, he said, resulted from living things being moved from their homeland and subjected to unfamiliar airs and nourishment. As he noted, everything is engendered with more grace and elegance and thrives best in its natural location, removed from which and placed in an alien land, it changes its nature and degenerates because of the difference in substance and climate. Well, the sort of shared language, plants as bastards, people as grafts, reminds us that natural history is not in any way separate from the science of humanity in the 18th century. Casta artists labeled and classified fruits alongside people because both form part of the same fundamental arrangement of knowledge. So I'd like to turn now to the second way in which we can think of Casta paintings as illuminating our understanding of 18th century natural history. And this concerns the vigorous enlightenment debate about the unity of the human species. Now, here I want to look a little bit at the figure of the mulatto. I apologize for this unpleasant terminology, but I want to look at the, this, this figure within 18th century scientific discourse and the Casta painting. Again, there's lots to be said about the way in which Casta paintings depict mulattoes, um, who in these paintings are usually understood as the children of a Spanish person and a black person. Here we have a picture of a family here. So what I want to focus on um, is one feature, and that is whether, um, within, whether the concept of whether a mulatto could have children. Casta paintings always include children um, born to mulattoes and mulattas. So there are lots of Casta paintings that show, here we have a, a mulatto man and a, his wife, Mestiza, and their baby. You can see here the father is entertaining the child while it's having its bottom wiped. So Casta paintings always show these sorts of um, generations. And they also show the offspring of, let's say, this little child when it grows up and further generations. There are all kinds of complicated names that are given to these children in, in Casta paintings. But um, Casta paintings always show generations descended from mulattoes. So here you have, the, as I said here, the fathers in these paintings are third or fourth generation descendants of so-called mulattoes shown with their own children. So we have whole genealogies. They're a characteristic feature of Casta paintings. Now, by depicting mulattoes and their descendants, Casta artists were implicitly contesting a potent polemic that was circulating during the Enlightenment, which argued against the fundamental unity of mankind. And this was the claim that mulattoes and their descendants were sterile. So let me try to explain this. 18th century Enlightened science agreed that different species could not produce fertile offspring. As Buffon, the doyen of Enlightened science explained, the axiom that members of a single species could reproduce, whereas those of different species cannot, is the most fixed point we have in natural history. Some scientists believe that it was just about possible for closely related species to reproduce, but that the offspring would itself be sterile or extremely feeble, as was the case, for example, with, the, with mules, the offspring of a male donkey and a female horse. So therefore, if men and women from different races were unable to reproduce, or if their descendants were unable to reproduce, this might suggest that, for instance, black people and white people were fundamentally different and belonged to different species. Many 18th century writers considered this issue and weighed in one way or another on it. So the reproductive capacity of the mulatta was freighted with scientific and theological significance regarding the unity of the human race. And those who argued in the 18th century that black people were fundamentally different from white people were particularly insistent that mulattoes were generally sterile. So Casta paintings, as I've just been suggesting, invariably depict 
the mulatto children born to mixed race black and white couples, the children born to those mulattoes, the offspring of those children, the mulatto of the Castor series was unquestionably able to engender generations of descendants. I mean, here are a few more, I'm sorry about this messy bit of captioning up here. Here we have a couple more such families. So these paintings disrupt assertions that because black and white people were so distinct as to constitute a different set of species, they were unable to reproduce. Castor paintings offer a potent visual rebuttal of this widespread and widely debated claim. Um, let me ask, how am I, I ask Julie, how am I doing on time in terms of whether I want to um, give another example or whether I should? Um, you have you? time. Okay, I won't, I'm not that I'm going to go on for great, great length. But I want to, to give another example of how Castor paintings likewise disrupt a debate within 18th century European science with the related question of whether black parents could give birth to white children or conversely, whether white parents could engender dark skinned children. Like this debate about the alleged sterility of mulattoes, this question interested 18th century science because they believed that it shed light on questions about the original color of human beings. So during the 18th century, there were a large number of children who, light-skinned children born to dark-skinned parents who toured Europe to the amazement of scientists and the public. I'm gonna briefly show you one illustration um, that Buffon reproduced, which I, um, of one such young woman um, who, as an example, I think it's not particular. I don't particularly want that we gaze at this woman who had to be illustrated um, naked. Um, there's a whole story about her. But a large number of these light skinned children born to dark skinned parents circulated through Europe during the 18th century. And scientists were very interested in this question of how this was possible. There were various views presented. Some scientists maintained that maternal imagination was enough to um, enable. Um, dark skinned parents to give birth to lighter skinned children. Um, but for some racial philosophers of the 18th century, the, um, these people provided to them reassuring evidence that the original color of humanity was white. So after considering such children, Buffon, for instance, decided that white appears to be the primitive color of nature, which then reappeared in certain circumstances such as in these, these children. And from this, he concluded that nature in her full perfection made men white and nature reduced to the last stage of adulteration renders them white again. So this so-called, this return to whiteness demonstrated to Buffon and a number of others, the residual power of humanity's original color, white. Um, all the more so given that as a number of 18th century racial scientists insisted, it was vastly more common for dark skinned people to give birth to lighter skinned children than the opposite. And those who maintained that black people were fundamentally different from white people were particularly insistent that white people seldom or never engendered dark skinned children. So that, there is the enlightenment science debate. Now, just as Castor paintings disrupted assertions that black and white people were so distinct as to constitute separate species. So they also disrupted the claim that humans were originally white and that therefore light skinned parents cannot engender dark skinned children, but that dark skinned people can engender light skinned children. Right? In fact, castor paintings show the opposite. Castor paintings never show these light skinned children born to dark parents, the very ones who were prompting Buffon to conclude that humanity was originally white. These people never feature in castor paintings. However, castor series always show dark skinned children born to light skinned parents, the very thing that racial scientists claimed was vanishingly rare and which might suggest that humanity's original color was black. And here's one such example. In castor paintings, these children are represented in multiple ways. Most often they're shown as the privileged offspring of loving parents who dandle their children on their knees or dress them in expensive clothing. So, and as for the notion that white was humanity's original color and so sometimes dark skinned people give birth to light skinned children, castor artists did not have any time for this idea at all. There are no such people depicted 
in caster paintings whatsoever. So in short, caster paintings do not visualize the claim that because humanity was originally white, white-skinned parents cannot give birth to dark-skinned children, but dark-skinned people can give birth to white-skinned children. Caster paintings do the opposite. So in other words, and I think this is the point that I'm trying to make as I now move towards a conclusion, caster paintings do not meekly reproduce the attitudes expressed by racial philosophers in the 18th century Atlantic world. Rather, we should view caster paintings as visual representations in their own right into debates about science and natural history, highly comparable to the botanical illustrations produced elsewhere in the new world about which we're going to be hearing in many other of the presentations. Caster paintings, in my view, should be set alongside textual debates about human diversity and natural history so that they can be recognized as making their own contributions to these debates through a visual medium. Caster paintings are not straightforward representations of European scientific racial debates, nor are they folkloric illustrations of Latin American culture disconnected from broader intellectual debates of the sort that animated natural history. And I think behind these at times charming or at times disturbing images of daily life, caster paintings offer potent interventions into some of the 18th century's most powerful debates about human nature. These debates were deeply embedded in the field of natural history, which is why, um, which wasn't, well, which is partly why I think we see natural history in the form of fruits, for example, appearing in these Gasta paintings over and over again. And natural history was time and again called in to adjudicate on disputes about race, about equality, about what it meant to be human. So return, to return to these, these little captions that make a Gasta painting a Gasta painting, they do indeed signal the painting's fundamental concerns with classification, with taxonomy, but they do so in ways that are far more complex than simply translating existing scientific consensus into a visual format. Visual materials, as scholars increasingly recognize, were themselves important sites for the production of knowledge. And I look forward very much to the remainder of this conference to hearing much more about this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And I just realized I've been uh, slightly remiss in my duties as moderator in that I, I believe I forgot to, to inform people that we're actually going to have Q&A directly after each paper. Um, so we now have, uh, so, <laughs> so this, is the, this is the announcement. So we have about six to eight minutes now um, to take any questions that you may have about, uh, about the paper that we just heard. Um, and if it's okay, I might actually just start with a question of my, of my own, Rebecca. Um, I, I mean, I, I um, was really compelled by what you said about the cost of paintings um, offering what you call potent visual rebuttals to some of these uh, discourses of racial difference. In the 18th century, um, you know, the, the paintings clearly have their own uh, visual logic. Um, so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more or, or even speculate about, um, you know, where is this uh, alternate way of thinking about race coming from, like that we find in the in the cost of paintings? Is it coming from, you know, uh, colonial ideas, you know, ideas that were being formulated in the Americas um, versus in Europe? Um, is it coming from everyday life? Um, you know, anything you could say about the, the origins of this, uh, of, this, um, of this logic? Yeah, and I, 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 I too have the cold, so I apologize for my, my coughing and sneezing. It's a good thing I'm not in the same room as the rest of you. So I think that the colonial origins are absolutely crucial to, to this. And I think that the way in which um, 18th century European science was able to formulate these, um, these claims about 
human beings and the nature of, um, for, for example, sexual reproduction was greatly facilitated by the location of those scientists. So I think the, the what, what do they call it? The locus of enunciation of scientists is relevant in the 18th century, just as it's relevant to scholarship today. So I think that's really important in explaining these different stories about humanity and the nature of the natural world that were emerging. So I, I mean, that's, I think, the thing that I would highlight most of all and why part of the reason why the sorts of images that we've already had a little look at from the, the introduction to the Linnaean Society's collections are really important to be incorporating into our vision of, of what might constitute science. And I'm sorry, I'm hardly the first person to be making that observation, but I think that's really, that's really crucial to, to it. I don't know if that goes some way to ask to answering what you were asking or yes. not quite. No, no, thank you very much. And we do have uh, some other questions. Uh, so uh, one person asks, I was wondering if you could say something about who the artists were. Yeah, um, not as much as I would like to. So many of these, these paintings, and there are hundreds of them. In fact, rather thrillingly, um, I, I, have, I have just realized that there is another, an, another set in Britain that was actually located in Leamington Spa, the town from which I speak, amazingly, had a set of Costa paintings in the 1820s, um, which is very interesting, um, making what would be the fourth set known in Britain. But there are lots of these paintings, however, the vast majority of them are by artists who, whose identities are unknown. And in fact, the entire genre operates in a, in a textual vacuum. It's quite, it's quite striking how little information we have about these paintings. So as I said, there are hundreds and hundreds of them. There are you know, examples in Britain. Um, there are ex many examples in Spain, many in Mexico. There are very few written comments from the 18th century about these paintings, very few descriptions of them, very few commentators, little information on commissions. So where we know something about the artists, it tends to be where there were well-known artists who produced other sorts of paintings, but the majority we don't know. And um, some of the artists about whom we do know something had, some of them were, for example, from non-white backgrounds, but many of them we just don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, I, we have a few other questions. So uh, another person asks, were these paintings on public display or were they commissioned for private use, instruction or as family records? Yeah, that's another good question. I've got my particular take on this, which I'm going to inflict on you since I'm being the person being asked. So. Um, well, there's a factual dimension, which is where were they displayed? Again, very often we don't know because there's so little written material, but some of them were monumental paintings of substantial grand size, um, multi, you know, many, you know, multiple meters in size. So they must have been owned by people who were um, possessed large houses. And we know about some commissions from viceroys, members of the colonial elite, and so the written records that we have of them tend to be coming from stately homes. The ones that we know about in Britain, for example, were located either in stately homes, where, which were on view. And so people, you know, as the stately home became a thing that you would go and visit, people could visit them. Or, for example, the set that, I, that had just been um, located in Leamington were on display in a gallery, as an, um, in an art gallery. What were they for? I think that they are the, the visual equivalent of a novel. I think that people were interested in them because they told stories, because they showed families and they constructed plausible settings for these imaginary families. So they're the equivalent of the colonial novel, a genre that flourished in 18th century Britain, didn't really have an equivalent of a written equivalent in Spanish America. So there are lots of novels that were produced in 18th century Britain telling stories of colonial romances. And there's a whole ex, you know, scholarship on what these novels are about. I think Custer paintings served a rather similar function. So they weren't hung up as a didactic purpose necessarily. They certainly weren't hung up to help 
officials classify people as sometimes people used to claim that you know people would that was somehow an aid memoir to um, officials who wanted to classify people. I don't think that's how they worked at all. The reason that people in stately homes hung these things on their walls is because they found them visually captivating and they were interested by the imaginary stories about these couples that you could extract from these, um, what are basically genre scenes. So that's, that's my, my view of what, what they were about and why people why people wanted to own them and why they were commissioned and why so many hundreds of them exist. Really fascinating. Um, and, you know, there's there's a question that is a good follow up to that, maybe. I, I mean, um, I love that idea that these are the equivalent of colonial novels or telling stories, but um, somebody asks if any of the paintings included non-human animal species as part of the family. Okay, interesting, as part of the family. Um, yes, in a sense. So um, let me see if I can, um, without taking up too much time, if I can go back to, um, if let's see, if we run back. So, oh, hang on, I've gone right past it. Here, for example, here we have a, here we have a parrot appearing, looking down. And the father, in some ways, is actually, the father is more engaged with the parrot. <laughs> Than, than he is um, with the rest of his family. So yes, they do, animals do appear. They're not, um, they tend not to be labeled in the same way that the fruit is, um, in the same way that the fruit, I mean, well here for example, here we have a little pair of lovebirds, right? Which I think is not a coincidence that in this happy family, we have, we have a little pair of lovebirds and I think a coconut. So yes, absolutely. What, um, follow on with the question that because that's a really interesting actually I've never really thought about that that's a very interesting question um which is making me think here we have another little bird think about that do the the person who asked the question do you have a a follow-up on what what you would make of that that's a really really productive thought for me that is, I mean, I, I agree. It's a very interesting question. Maybe while we're waiting to see if there is a follow-up, um, I'll ask uh, one final question um, that somebody else had. Are there any Costa paintings from the Spanish East Indies, for example, the Philippines? Yeah, another good question. Not, not that I am aware of, and nothing with those same kinds of captions. I mean, the category in some ways is a somewhat artificial one because it's a modern term. At the time, people called them paintings of intermarriages of Spaniards and Indians or that sort of thing. And it is those labels that allowed people looking at them to know who those people were, right? Without the label, it's a family, but you don't have, they don't, they're not casted. But I'm not aware of anything like that from the Philippines. And they're really only produced from Mexico and a few from Peru. So other parts of Spanish America didn't go in for this genre either. And I don't have a good explanation for why that was. Other than the power of artistic um, style as being something that um, can, you know, a particular style of painting emerges in particular places and then people adopt that style. But it's, it's a good question that, for which I don't have a good answer. Yeah, no, I, I, it does really speak to the, the locality of, you know, of uh, cultures of science in this period. And, um, you know, that there were really colonial specific contexts for this, uh, the production of these knowledges. Oh, but I see um, Dominique. Yeah, Dominique, uh, follow up. Would you like to follow up your question about animals? Yes, thank you. I was just, uh, it was more a question of if the animals were kind of a parallel story of, because that's another topic that was quite important to Enlightenment uh, natural history is how animal breeding uh, happened. And so I was more wondering if they actually made parallels to non-human animals in these uh, paintings. Uh, and I, yeah, um, yeah, I, th I think it's a complicated story, but yeah, maybe important to think about. That's, yeah, well, that's certainly very, I mean, that's really something I hadn't been thinking about, but in your, for sure, those parallels were important in the, um, the Hispanic world, for example. I think that there, I mean, this, 
there are treatises about horse breeding, actually some of them I think produced in the Philippines as well, that talk in a very explicitly parallel way about the breeding of horses and the breeding of people um, emerging out of the Hispanic world. So it's a, it's a set of parallels that could plausibly be present in these paintings. Um, and I need to think about whether they are in some way, not in terms of captioning, so captioning and not in terms that I'm aware of, of showing um, generations of different animals being bred. But let me think about, that's a really, really thoughtful, thoughtful question. Thank you. Thank you so much for following up. And um, uh, thank you, Rebecca, for you know, a wonderfully complex talk. I mean, showing how, how intricate and layered these visual depictions are, and you know, really why they're worth looking at more carefully. Um, it's time to move on to the next talk. Um, so I'm, I, I would invite uh, Maloney Roy, our, our next speaker, to come online. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, so Melanie Roy is, uh, is at the British Library and um, I will let her take it from there. And again, after she speaks, we'll have about 10 minutes of Q&A on her paper. Great, thank you. Can you, I, I assume everyone can hear me. Um, so I just wanted to start off by thanking Isabel and Julie for the very kind introduction to speak. Um, at today's conference. Um, I should clarify that I come from an art historical background. So the classification of animals and some of the scientific content really comes from the support of colleagues um, at the Natural History Museum and Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh, um, colleagues who've been helping me with various projects on natural history drawing. And my interest in this topic really comes from working with quite a diverse collection held at the British Library in the former India office collections. And we have about 5,000 natural history drawings which were first cataloged by Mildred Archer in the 1970s. And we rely quite heavily on Archer's publication to um, do any further research on the topic. But of course, not much has been done since her book um, aside for the work of Henry Nolte and Mark Watson on some of these collections, but relating to botanicals. But as I've been working with the collection um, for more than 10 years, um, I've been really interested in the field of natural history and some of these very beautiful paintings. And I really had the opportunity to start working on these paintings when the Wallace Collection just started discussing their exhibition called Forgotten Masters, which was held in London in the winter of 2019 through the spring summer of 2020. And for this exhibition, I decided to suggest that they feature the work of Haludar, um, who's a Bengali artist who um, features quite heavily within our natural history collections. And Haludar's paintings um, have quite important scientific importance. However, most of his paintings also have a very um, an art historical dimension because they're quite distinctive and they show a true likeness of each species and really demonstrates Holodar's skill as an artist. So the concept of natural history drawings in South Asia really starts in the late 16th century. Um, so we have a very important memoir held in the British Library's collection called The Memoirs of Babur, or the Babur Nama, which is uh, an imperial biography of the first Mughal emperor of India, which the text itself dates to around the uh, mid-16th century. And Babur wrote his memoirs and observations of South Asia in around 1526 when he conquered uh, the region. But it was only in the later 16th century, around the 1590s, that the text was translated from a dialect of Turkish into Persian, and his grandson commissioned illustrations to accompany the text. And these are rather lovely illustrations. Not all of them are signed. And that's just something that's quite important to note, that in the Mughal tradition of painting, artists' names were not often captured. But in this one, um, specifically, you begin to find 
the names of the artists and their details inscribed by the court librarian in red in the um, margins of painting. So in the late 18th century, um, the parameters of South Asian art expanded because you've got the presence of British and European collectors and patrons who started commissioning local artists. Oops, I jumped, missed a slide. Um, so before I go into that, I just briefly mentioned these two paintings, otherwise we'll forget. Um, this is a zebra and a chameleon by one of the most important natural history artists in the 16th century, 17th century, um, Mansour, who not only painted these two wonderful studies, but he's one of the first artists to have encountered a dodo. And he painted um, a, a dodo specimen that was brought to the court of one of the Mughal emperors named Jahangir in the early 17th century. And for that, um, he's well known for having the first fully colored illustration of a dodo. So going ahead back, or going back to the 19th, uh, 18th century, when we start seeing British and European collectors and patrons commissioning local artists, we begin to see a change in the painting style. So they started illustrating local trades and occupations, topographical views and architectural subjects, but more importantly for us, um, natural history studies. And Mildred Archer, who was the curator of the collections in the 1970s, um, she defined this new phase of art as a company period in reference to the, the new wave of patronage. And of course, there's this clear distinction with artistic style and painters started adapting their techniques to quicken the pace of production. And they shifted away from applying opaque watercolors that needed to be burnished um, for the pigments to consolidate and create the jewel-like effect that was characteristic to portly miniature paintings to more um, quicker paced paintings using watercolors. And on the screen, you see two examples. The one on the left of the bird, the minor bird, is from one of the Balgornoma folios. And it actually only measures about four centimeters in height. But on the opposite side, we've got this painting of a fish called Mushri, um, which is from, it's believed to be from Southern India or Mysore from the early 19th century. And these are more about, um, I would say approximately 20 by 30 centimeters in size. And so it's quite different to see um, the style of painting. And natural history drawings, of course, would emerge as one of the most prolific genres. And this is a direct consequence of the interest of British and Scottish surgeons, as well as natural history enthusiasts in documenting local flora and fauna. And of course, while this concept of documenting natural history within South Asian painting traditions is by no means unique, Haludar and his contemporaries were specifically following in the footsteps of artists such as Ram Das, Bhavani Das, Sheikh Zain Uddin, who painted natural history drawings for Lady Mary Impey in Calcutta. And Impey, um, she was the wife of Sir Elijah Impey, the chief justice of the courts. And she had her own menagerie in Calcutta in the 1770s and 80s. And she commissioned Bhavani Das paint fish studies for her collection. And of course, these were fully executed drawings of either a lateral or profile view of the subject without any additional details. And they seem more to be portraits of her animals. And we've got a couple on the screen. One is a scaly anteater by uh, Sheikh Zainuddin, which is held in the British Library's collection. And then we've got a fish and a bat. And the bat with outstretched wings, I believe is in the Metropolitan Museum. And in the very bottom, we have a portrait of Mary Impey with her household. And you begin to see artists and artisans working um, for her directly. And looking at um, the works of Haludar, um, and we'll see them shortly, is that the Impey artists worked on large sheets of laid paper, and these were imported from England. And um, the paintings were prepared in center. So you might have a fish that only measures about three centimeters across or a, an, uh, the pangolin, which is about 20 centimeters across on a very large sheet of paper, which could be about 40 to 60 centimeters in width. At the very start of my research, um, 
on Haludar, um, I started talking to Henry Nolte and Mark Watson because of their own research on Francis Buchanan Hamilton. And it's within Buchanan Hamilton's collection that you begin to find uh, the work of Haludar. And it was really from that point that I started speaking to someone else who was Ralph Britz, who was formerly of the Natural History Museum in London. And he was working on Buchanan Hamilton's Fishes of the Ganges. And he directed me to this very key source of information, which is on the screen. And this is an 1816 publication by the French zoologist Henri de Blainville. And he wrote in this text that he found a new species of service Niger. And this could be identified after a very beautiful colored drawing that was completed on site by Haludar, an Indian painter. And go, taking this a bit further and researching through biodiversity website, um, I found a second article in another pu publication, a German publication by a naturalist called Lorenz Oken. And he also referred to the same painting, stating that it was painted on the spot by a master painter called Haludar. And what's quite interesting is that both these references to Service Niger, which is an Indian somber deer, only provided very brief descriptions of the species and omitted to give any details of the source of scientific information of the species or um, sorry, where the drawing was located. But cross-referencing Ni uh, Service Niger with Haludar, I was directed to a single drawing in the British Library's collection that was commissioned by the Scottish surgeon, Francis Buchanan Hamilton. And we see this on the left. So this is one of many paintings that were deposited um, to the East India Company's library, which was later um, referred to as the India Office Library, which is now part of the British Library. And this was deposited in 1808, just two years after being painted. And the paintings are all inscribed with the artist's name by Buchanan Hamilton. And it's one of the 28 natural history drawings um, that have Haludar's name um, in the corner. And these were all prepared between 1795 to 1818 when Buchanan was working for a surgeon for, as a surgeon for the East India Company and actively documenting botanical and zoological specimens um, during his travels across the subcontinent. Of the company officials interested in natural history, um, Buchanan, alongside botanist William Roxburgh, was one of those who supervised local artists to prepare scientific drawings of the specimens they collected. And copies of these and duplicate sets of the natural history drawings were commissioned with the intention that a set would remain in India, while another would be sent to the East India Company's library in London. And natural history enthusiasts, including Marcus Wellesley, the Governor General of Bengal, Lord Clive, the Governor General, um, sorry, the Governor of Madras, and Major General Thomas Hardwick also had sets made for their personal collections. Buchanan, um, just to give a bit of a biographical background, was born in Scotland and studied in Glasgow and Edinburgh, obtaining a doctoral degree in 1783. And part of his medical training, he was required to gain a thorough understanding of the classification and identification and uses of medical plants. And he trained under John Hope, a professor of botany, and who taught him this uh, classification system of Carl Linnaeus. And after being appointed as the assistant surgeon in Bengal um, for the East India Company, he arrived in 1794 and immediately joined an embassy to Burma. Um, and he was, there for approximately several months. And botanists Mark Watson and Henry Nolte of the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh document that Buchanan took copious notes and methodologically collected herbarium specimens that he sent back to the Calcutta Botanic Gardens. And for this, he worked with one specific drawing, another Bengali draftsman, an artist called Singhi Bay, who provided about 55 drawings of botanical specimens. So we're not really sure when exactly um, his encounter with Haludar begins, but already Buchanan Hamilton was working with several local artists 
um, upon arriving in India and within the first five years. And after the embassy um, returned to Calcutta, Buchanan transferred to the company's factory in Lakshmipur in Southeast Bangladesh. And he remained there for the next three years, serving the capacity of surgeon um, until 1798. And it's here he started looking at freshwater fishes and started documenting um, the very specimens of fishes. And he wrote that he hired a young Bengali artist to draw various species he encountered. And unfortunately, his written biography that's published omits the artist's name. About two decades after Buchanan started documenting the fishes, he arranged for the publication of the book, a volume. And this came out in 1822 and included about descriptions for 272 species alongside 97 illustrations that he commissioned. In the British Library's collection, we have a single manuscript from Buchanan's, Buchanan's collection that includes 104 colored drawings out of which 97 were published. And in 1929, um, an Indian ichthyologist and later director of the Zoological Society of India, Dr. Hora, wrote that there was no work that was of greater importance for a student of Indian freshwater fishes. But it was Hora's work in 1931 that he found a manuscript in the Australian Museum, handwritten by Buchanan, that provided supplementary information on the Bengali artist. It, and I'm hoping I've got the next slide. Oops. So in that text, um, it wrote that 78 illustrations were by Holudar, a Bengali youth. And this is quite interesting because this is the first time you have the name Holudar mentioned in connection to a significant corpus of illustrations. Amongst the about 5,000 drawings that we hold within the British Library's collection, the majority are unsigned, and the patrons who commissioned or acquired these sets neglected to document the names of the artists. And it's quite interesting that Horace's letter also talks about the systematic approach to painting the specimens and how what the financial um, offerings were to um, Polydar, and he was paid a gold mohur a month, and he was employed specifically to work on fishes. He wrote that Polydar was asked to draw the outlines with some degree of accuracy, and when he succeeds, that he would begin coloring them. And when he says he, he means um, that Buchanan Hamilton himself would, would do the coloring. However, when we start looking at the paintings, we see that although Buchanan is saying that this is a collaborative process. In fact, this is a single, um, it's all the work is actually done by Holudar. And Holudar stayed in Lakshmipur for about three years between 1795 to 1798. And Mildred Archer felt that it was most likely that Holudar remained um, afterwards in the Cal working for um, the Calcutta Botanic Gardens and for Roxburgh and that Roxford actually referred Holudar to work for Buchanan. And speaking to Ralph Fritz about some of these paintings, so on the screen I've got um, Buchanan Hamilton's manuscript with one of Holudar's drawings of a fish. And this is, um, it's quite interesting to hear Buchanan, sorry, Fritz's comments that, um, that all of these were painted looking at live specimens rather than the standard practice of using preserved specimens. And Fritz also clarified that from a scientific perspective, Holudar was working to Buchanan's instructions. Hence, for each specimen, he drew a fully colored lateral view of the fish and a pen and ink outline of the dorsal view, which you can see on the left. Holudar must have accompanied Buchanan on his local expeditions and completed the drawings on the spot to preserve the color variations of the specimen. And following Buchanan's posting at Lakshmipur, it's unclear whether Holudar accompanied Buchanan over the next few years to Chittagong, Mysore, Nepal, when um, Buchanan was traveling on behalf of the company between 1798 to 1803. But 
going ahead and looking forward, it's really difficult to know how many paintings Haludar completed over the course of these years. We know approximately Haludar painted um, 104 drawings of fishes, and then there's duplicate copies that were prepared for Wellesley. And then there was a set made for Hardwick, which is now held in the Library of the Natural History Museum. So approximately there's about 225 species that were painted in total. But one of the fun things that I found at the library and complements some of our holdings are the drawings relating to the mammal studies. And this is a document called the list of drawings of quadrupeds and birds made out of under the inspection of Mr. Gibbon and of Dr. Fleming and Buchanan and deposited in the library of the Honorable East India Company. And in this set, we've got 19 lists. Um, they listed 26 mammals and 28 birds that are by um, Haludar. So, and I wanted to share a couple of these paintings, and this is one of my favorites. And we begin to find that Haludar shifts his style of painting rather than showing an outline, a pen and ink outline. He goes straight into drawing fully executed paintings. And these are quite, he prefers depicting animals from a lateral viewpoint, possibly to correspond to Buchanan's notes. And the remainder of the page was left blank. And in this painting, you begin to see a very meticulous study where you see the picture plane is left decluttered and the painting itself is meticulous. So with precision, doc, uh, Holodar documented each scale of feather or tuft of animal's fur. And for the study of the sloth bear, um, along the outline of the animal's body, you begin to see each strand of coarse hair radiating outwards as if static electricity forced the hair to stand out. And as a, as a result, you begin to see a sense of three dimensionality um, and the bear seems almost lifelike. Another highlight, and I know this was a personal favorite of Padma's, is um, the Moloch Gibbon. And what I find quite fascinating is in this one, he decides to use the same specimen to pre present the animal in three different views, from the front, the back, and from the side. But when you start zooming in and looking close up to the paintings, you begin to see every strand of hair. Um, you begin to see both the cross hatching on the arms and clear partings to show where the roots of hair began. And you begin to also see the sheer length of the arms and how distinctive um, the body types are when you begin to see this. And in the bottom corner, um, if you can see my um, the mouse, the cursor, you can find Haludar's name and then some of the inscriptions by the East India Company Library in pencil. And in some of the paintings, you begin to find um, transliterations in multiple languages of the names of the animals they were identifying and illustrating. And this is a beautiful one, um, and it corresponds to the notes in Buchanan's journals. And this is um, um, a yellow monitor lizard. And it's quite fun reading his descriptions about you know, with accuracy that he writes, this is a golden species and when 33 inches long, it's considered fully grown. And I quite enjoy reading some of these descriptions because you get a bit of understanding of what Buchanan was looking at and how he was identifying some of these um, different species. However, one of the problems that you find is that um, Buchanan, he may have not known exactly what the species were, and he would put his own um, scientific names that were later changed by various um, natural historians such as Thomas Hardwick. And this is the case, particularly when you look at Kaludar's illustration of the service Niger. And for this, um, he depicted the single deer to show the lateral um, view and included some of his annotations. But when you zoom in and look at some of the annotations, in fact, the librarian of the East India Company 
started annotating and adding additional notes. And what he discovered was that although this was identified and produced for Buchanan Hamilton, he makes a reference to the publication that I first showed of um, Plainville and that he published it in his own name without quoting Buchanan. And it's very um, astute of the librarian of the East India Company to start picking up some of these problems that he was finding in terms of the transfer of scientific information. Because while it was Buchanan's original collection that identified the species, it was Blainville who was taking credit. Um, I could continue and go on, but I'll just show you a few more slides of some of the works um, that are held in the library's collection and that are by Halidar. And as I've shown you the Moloch Gibbon, we also have a duplicate that was copied for uh, the Marquess Wellesley. And this dates to approximately the same period. But for the Wellesley collection, we find the artist also integrated a natural landscape, which is completely contrary to what we find in the scientific studies produced for Buchanan Hamilton. And these include um, normally incomplete landscape studies, but you begin to see how the animal would be presented in situ. And just to finally uh, to share some other um, of my favorites, and we've got the pigeons and the cheetah, and I'm not gonna, rem I don't remember exactly what species of bird this may be. Um, it could be a heron, but it could be completely wrong. But what I found really interesting in doing my research on Holudar is one of the things that I found out speaking to Ralph Fritz is that coming from an art historical perspective, you begin to see the importance of the works in terms of a stylistic transition of painterly styles. But from a scientific perspective, they've known about Holudar's work for a bit longer. And in fact, in 2013, um, ichthyologist renamed a genius a genus of fish to Holudaria in recognition of Holudar's drawings of toothless fish because they were published in Hamilton's 1822 Fishes of the Ganges. And this was an instrumental work in identifying the species today. So on that note, I will stop sharing. and hand over to Julie. Thank you so much, Melanie. This is an incredibly rich presentation. And I, I do invite people now to ask their questions. We have about five or six minutes for questions. Um, but I, I did actually just want to ask, you know, on one of the last points you made about this transition between artistic styles and traditions, um, really found it fascinating that you, um, you know, you talked about, um, uh, you know, contextualize Holodar within this longer, much longer tradition of, um, you know, uh, South Asian nature painting, or maybe even Mughal miniature painting. Um, and then by the end, we also see, but when we see the sloth bear at the end, and, you know, it's such an innovative portrayal, and as you say, getting into three dimensionality. So I'm just wondering if you speak a little bit more about how you see Holodar combining these traditions or deviating from, from them. Yeah, um, so one of the things when you start looking at Indian paintings in general, you find that artists are really traditionally looking at um, using, you know, heavy pigments to apply onto papers and that's burnished and you get this jewel like effect. But with the introduction of more of more of a water based gouache um, paint that comes really into play in around um, the 1770s onwards. Um, there's some artists working for a French colonel named um, Jean-Baptiste Chanty um, in Lucknow. And that's where you really begin to start seeing the usage of this material or this mater medium. And you start seeing small illustrations of natural history sub subjects on maps. And that's where it really begins um, in a way it becomes a bit prominent. But when you start looking at these larger studies of the natural history drawings produced for Buchanan Hamilton and Lady Mary Impey, it comes into a complete different, um, 
it's a complete different subject and artistic concept because rather than a manuscript illumination, you're having individual works on paper that could be framed up or could be bound in a volume. And these are individual studies and there's, I guess they're more of a series of paintings rather than accompanying written text. So rather than, a, how would I put it? Like an encyclopedic work, it's just visual illustrations of um, natural history studies. And with the Buchanan Hamilton material, at least you have corresponding uh, field notes and indexes to accompany those works. But I think I'll stop there. <laughs> we thank you. And I think Isabel has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, I was I was curious about the signature, actually, the Halu there pinks it. And I was wondering if you think he signed it or, or some. Someone else. No, I think that's all by Buchanan Hamilton. Um, and I think it would be worth comparing his handwriting and his field notes to some of the, the pencil inscriptions, because I'm not sure exactly, because they're in pencil, unlike his field notes, which are in ink. Um, and then um, when you see the inscriptions in multiple languages, those are also in ink. So we've got to just be a bit um, to cross reference everything. And that's something I've never really sat down to do. Um, to see, because I don't think Holodar would have written in English, so. Can I ask a follow-up? Sure. Is that right? <laughs> um, so as, as a result, I'd, from what you were saying, uh, you weren't sure whether um, Holodar was still with Buchanan Hamilton when he went to Nepal, which makes me think that the, the illustrations that we have in our collections are probably not by him. Um, it's not something I've looked at because the botanical paintings are a complete minefield for someone like me. And so that's something I would have to really spend some time looking and then looking at duplicate sets as well to see how they're produced. Because with the fishes and the natural history, um, the mammals, they're very distinctive and they're very detailed. Whereas from a quick look at some of the botanicals, you don't find that fine level of detail. It's more of a, um, an artistic work rather than a scientific, I'm complete, you know, I've just looked at it for two seconds. Um, so I don't really want to put my foot in my mouth right now. No, that, that's fine. And I, I think Claire Banks, who's doing a PhD on these is, is in the audience. So she might, um, I'll have to, I'll have to ask her. <laughs> Thank you, Marlene. Thanks. Well, um, yeah. Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, it is 11.30, so I think we actually should move on to the last um, presentation, but if you do have questions, please do feel free to um, put them in the Q&A after the speaker's presentation is over, since the speakers are going to try to answer any remaining questions during lunch break. They'll be able to, they can type in an answer to you, so you can still see, you can still get an answer. Um, okay, but uh, yes, our, our last, presenter um, is is joining us um, completely virtually. She has uh, pre-recorded her presentation. So um, uh, we're, we're not going to have a traditional Q and A after. Um, but you know, again, if you if you do want to type your questions in, we can um, convey them to her. So the speaker is Josepha Richard, um, University of Bristol. And uh, I would just ask Isabel or Padma to start playing it. You can see this? Or... Yes, I think. Okay. Hello, I would first like to thank Isabelle Charmentier and the Linnean Society for inviting me to present today. Uh, just a little warning that for practical reasons, I will use the word Westerner to stand for Western Europeans and Northern Americans and China and Chinese to mean the territory and the subjects of the Qing dynasty, the last of Chinese dynasties. This paper, um, I'm going to share the screen with you first. Um, here we go. So this paper aims to demonstrate the agency of Chinese go-betweens in an early example of Sino-Western botanical paintings in the late 18th century Canton. So to quickly introduce the historical context, the paintings are discussed were made shortly before 
during and shortly after the period known as the Canton system, during which Westerners wanting to enter China typically only had access to a few locations, such as the city of Guangzhou or Canton and the nearby Macau, with some exceptions such as Jesuits that could access the court in Beijing. So where is uh, Canton in China? Well, if you follow the green uh, arrow, you'll see it's in the uh, southeast. And then more specifically, uh, it's the capital of Guangdong province uh, in the Delta, the Pearl River Delta. Um, so, in the 18th and 19th century, the context of European imperial imperialism meant that early Western botanical exploration of China, from missionaries to plant hunters, had tended to erase Chinese agency to the profit of the Western agency. So until recently, uh, we could read that British naturalists were considered pioneers for commissioning botanical paintings in the 19th century Canton, and many of their Western contemporaries at the time implied that Chinese records of their own flora was so lacking as to not deserve mention. So this paper aims to balance a bit uh, this my postdoc, um, which this paper comes from, has focused on an abandoned bot botanical project that, by his very unfinished nature, allows us to look into the part that Chinese go-betweens took in early British naturalist endeavors in China, and thus to balance what was previously a biased view of the natural history of China and overwhelmingly told by the Western perspective. Um, so Blake's botanical project, what it is, John Bradby Blake uh, trained himself as a botanist before following in the steps of his father, Blake Sr., a captain for the East India Company. However, when young Blake applied to become a supercargo or trader for the British East India Company, he was not hoping to become a captain. Instead, he was aiming specifically for an appointment in China, which he obtained in 1766, and soon he became one of the resident British traders that supervised the tea trade in Canton. From the start, his goal, however, was to use the spare time of a of trade season or at the end of the day to collect and experiment on any Chinese plants that he could find, many of which were little known in Europe at the time. Before embarking for China, Blake had actually met with eminent naturalists such as Daniel Solander and John Ellis in London, who advised him on using the Linnean system to classify previously unknown Chinese plants. Only his early death in the fall of 1773 put a premature end to Blake's project, although his dad tried to resurrect it uh, briefly. So what was Blake's ambition? Well, to form a complete Chinensis of drawings open from nature. And really, that was actually uh, the earliest systematic attempt to document the diversity of Chinese plants from a non-Chinese. But because of such a, um, a lack of knowledge from Blake, uh, it was actually very um, unrealistic. It was an overly ambitious idea. Uh, when one remembers um, how restricted Western movements were in China at the time, and also, of course, when one knows the wide range of Chinese flora. Um, so to give you a bit of an idea, um, Blake himself did not realize probably how ambitious he was because he was working from the very small confines of the factories in Canton and Macau, which were little buildings uh, next to the Pearl River the, in the star that I show there with an arrow. Um, and they were not allowed to even enter the city itself and could only do with very little excursions around the suburbs of a city. Uh, and the inside of the factories were quite narrow and long and mostly uh, kept for tea uh, storing and selling. And of course, he had to do uh, with that to put some plants in pots uh, and paint them. So he still managed to make do. Um, how did he do so? Well, he had a working method. He determined
telling him what to redo. And then he sent a lot of seeds and, of course, the paintings to Britain. And he aimed uh, eventually to publish the paintings, probably with notes, uh, and to be elected to the Royal Society as a fellow. Um, so, of course, this could not be done alone with those very restrictive uh, situation, and also his talents were not um, that great. So he could not draw, for example. So his project had several people working on. The Western naturalists were already mentioned, but uh, there's a lot of Chinese go-betweens as well. So some of them needed to procure the plants and the knowledge about them. Um, some of them needed to translate and read the Chinese books on plants that he used. And some of them needed to paint the plants. And of course, on the paintings, there were also things like Chinese names, uh, romanization or, or transcription of the names into something that English people could pronounce and sometimes Latin inscriptions or English transcriptions. And then of, afterwards, uh, Captain Blake's, the father of Blake, Captain Blake, continued to work on the project um, with the help of another go-between I'll mention later. So all these little Ivy's people uh, could have been one and the same in, in, in cases, but uh, we have reason to think that they were multiples. And I will focus on the painter for today. Um, so, um, so far we have found hundreds of Blake Commission paintings uh, across the world um, and related paintings that we believe might be copies and most of which are kept in the Oxpring Garden Foundation in Virginia which I am a postdoc uh, fellow for. These albums in Oxpring along with several notebooks of manuscript notes were kept by Blake's family until the 1960s and then they were sold to Paul and Rachel, Rachel Mellon, who owned Oxpring. So that's why they were kept all together very nicely and that uh, we can do so much uh, about this collection. Uh, but of course, there were also other collections, which I'll mention later. So let's talk about the go-between that was a painter. Well, he's exceptionally named, which is rare at the time, uh, although we are not sure if this name of Maxa or Maxo, I'm not very good at pronouncing Cantonese names, are actually real uh, or made up because for Cantonese speakers that doesn't sound like a real name. So he could have given this to his Western uh, clients for his own reasons. Uh, we know that he was 33 years of age and lived in Canton. So apart from that, we don't know that much, but we can make assumptions. Um, and we do know that he was very good at what he did well we just have to look at the paintings but also blake himself we don't think ever learned how to draw we don't have proof of that so he seems to have recognized the importance of his chinese painter and he noted in a letter that this chinese flora was a joint endeavor with him and he has written here in those uh, in that extensive quote that it was really worth paying a lot of money for his services and that they worked together for long hours, uh, obviously, uh, with an assistant from an assistance from Blake. So this was really a joint work. Um, so who Maxa could have been? Well, the first thing we can think of is um, probably he could have been uh, someone who received a formal training in academic Chinese painting. So there's a style called the bird and flower traditional Chinese painting genre that actually specializes in depicting realistic plants, as we can see here, peonies. Um, but those tended to be very well-known people. So Maxa doesn't seem to fit necessarily in those names, uh, or at least we didn't find him in records. Perhaps he was not his real name. Um, but it is clear that without Maxa's talents, Blake's commission paintings would not have reached such a high quality, so the plant had to contain a faithful representation of all the necessary parts for Western naturalists to be able to identify it. The fact that Maxa was so proficient at it perhaps comes from a training as an export painter. So those were painters who made exclusive paintings for the Western market, not for the Chinese uh, market. And those uh, painters based in Canton had the ability to copy even Western oil painting to very close likeness. And that was well known at the time in the Western community in Canton. And as you can see there in this later quote in the 19th century, um, despite the overwhelmingly condescending tone, 
from Nathan Dunn, he actually had a collection of Chinese art and he thought that Chinese export painters were really good at copying. So this was a fact and it, it is uh, perhaps the reason why Blake hired Max Sao. Another thing that we can presume about Max Sao is that he might have had a specific training and he would have consulted perhaps Chinese botanical books such as the classic Materia Medica's um, Le Ben Sao Gang Mu or perhaps uh, more um, other books uh, that are available to all Chinese painters such as the Mustard Seed Garden Manual of Painting. Uh, we have an anonymous mention in Blake's manuscripts that a painter was involved in representing a certain poisonous plant on posters uh, to be posted everywhere in the streets as a warning to the Chinese population to avoid eating a specific poisonous plant that had made a lot of uh, unfortunate uh, death uh, in a certain season. So it's possible Maxa was that painter that painted those plants and had already uh, studied uh, how to represent plants realistically or, or at least in a way that the Chinese population would recognize at the time. So once we know um, more or less the hypothesis for his tr training, uh, how did they proceed? Well, as I mentioned before, they were using Western botanical references, such as camphor, and they were um, using those as both to find plants that were already present in England and of course tried to aim for plants that were not yet found, but also to look at those compositions and inspire their own paintings. So Black and Maxow um, worked on the selection that Blake himself made um, and he had both these books with him in Canton. Uh, but he also uh, had a very exceptional source, which was uh, the fact that Blake's father was described to the John Miller's illustrations, and as they were published uh, from the sexual system of Linus, they were sent to Blake in China, and they were there to guide the work of Maxar. So Maxar could benefit from the latest uh, in illustrations, botanical illustrations. Uh, of course, there was also the dependent, the Chinese uh, botanicals that I mentioned just before, the Materia Medica. We have recently found in Canterbury Cathedral Archives that Blake had actual copies of two of the most important books of Chinese Materia Medica, the Ben Sao Gang Mu and the Ben Sao Bei Yao, and we saw his handwritten annotations in the books themselves and where he selected the plants he wanted painted and as you can see those plants were not represented very realistically in those Materia Medica books but they were good enough to find what these plants were uh, useful for of course. Um, so what did a typical uh, painting look like in the Blake uh, commissions? Well there was a black border uh, which is the way we managed to recognize them when they mixed in other collections. Uh, the, the name in Chinese and a Cantonese transcription or romanization was written next to it and um, usually the plant is centered, uh, although sometimes it slips beyond the border uh, and there's a, a varying degree of, of details uh, it could be uh, that the leaf is penciled, sometimes it's not there, and there's a lot of details of magnification of fruits and flowers and seeds that are added um, as uh, the season goes. Um, more, more details were added to the paintings. Um, we know that Blake asked Maxo to, to add those details as the plant grew in the factories. So we have actually um, different entries saying which week of which month of which year each addition was uh, put in each painting. So a few examples for your uh, pleasure, <laughs> a Camellia japonica, um, flat peaches, uh, exora chinensis, well, there's many more and these are the most finished of the paintings, uh, let's say, uh, because if they were actually uh, copies. So while it is clear that Blake controlled the exact composition of the paintings working with Max Sao, uh, he actually asked for feedback from specialists in Europe. Max Sao himself would have been the one translating the Western botanical system into legible paintings and that might have of course come with sometimes 
uh, less perfect results. Um, so we know that maps are how to produce a number of more or less completed paintings for each plant. And uh, these we have found in at least two of the collections, the Natural, Natural History Museum in London and the Royal College of Physicians in London. Um, so there's still more that we find, but not as in so many uh, quantities, so, so large quantities every time. Uh, but these are more like 70 and uh, 50 respectively. Um, and these are clearly simpler in many instances. And we think those were the ones that were sent to Solander for comments and uh, not the finished version, although there are some that are rather finished. And why would copies be made? Well, some of it was for safekeeping during the long trip back home. Uh, uh, in the boats that could sink, ships could always see it sink. But there was also that part of the trial and error process that we mentioned to produce satisfactory illustrations that Solander had to approve back in London. So there was this back and forth. Uh, and sometimes some plants uh, needed to be remade, repainted. Um, so we know, for example, that um, some plants were marked with a C in the registers in the manuscripts and that probably stands for copy and that's how Blake uh, kept track of how many paintings he had of each plant. So an example of a simpler painting um, in the Natural History Museum of London of the Longan and uh, here of a more uh, completed painting in Oxpring. So if I go back here we go um, and there, definitely a, a bit more scientifically uh, precise for the purposes of a Linnean uh, specialist there. Um, so, now that the working process from Blake is clear and Maxal, um, let's quickly talk about another Chinese go-between that was involved in the Blake project, Wang Atong. He was a famous visitor in 18th century England. Uh, you might have heard of him. We know that uh, he was parodied around London when he visited in the 70s, 75 to 7. Uh, he was brought in aristocratic circles. Uh, Joseph Banks in introduced him to the Royal Academy. But... Um, what people don't know is that he also helped Captain Blake to annotate his son's notes. Perhaps Blake was hoping to publish the flora posthumously. Uh, we know that the Royal Society did approve Blake's application, but a few months too late, he had already died. So Wang Atong probably brought some effects from Canton to London to Blake's father. But he also brings us that connection to Joseph Banks that we had not really discussed before, although the two might never have met because Banks was on the endeavor when Blake was leaving for China. Um, there's, of course, a connection because most of the plant connector, collectors that visited China during the Canton system after Blake's death were British naturalists sent by the one and only Joseph Banks whom at the time was considered Britain's foremost patron of natural history. And of course, others have discussed Banks in much more detail than I will, uh, but I can say that contrarily to the Blakes who worked on their own initiative within a small position inside the East India Company, Banks clearly had a powerful reach within the British imperial network, and he could dispatch or correspond with plant collectors across the world. So here we see he sent several of those plant collectors every couple of decades to China. So it would be strange if there was no connection there. Um, so here we have an example of the botanical paintings that these uh, collectors commissioned um, one after the other from Chinese artists in Canton. And we can see that plants such as peonies were repeatedly looked for because they were difficult to bring safely back to Europe and they were known to not flower uh, in certain climates. Uh, so over the compositions and degree of, um, of, of detail and scientific accuracy are of course very different here. There was clearly um, some common uh, theme that certain uh, those plant collectors followed, and that was to find plants that people back in England would find appealing and, and in Britain. 
but uh, we don't know much about painters that work for those collectors because they work squarely within the British Empire network and agenda and rarely recorded their artist names. And some names that are actually recorded are even nicknamed or doubtful, like Reeves painters are all like starting with A, ah, with an A. So Akyu, Akam, Akut and Asong probably are nicknames or uh, fun names. And voluntarily or not, uh, those plant collectors were often given credit for compositions of paintings that were created actually before they even arrived in China. So let me explain uh, what I mean by this. Um, for example, uh, while it was previously known that John Reeves, who uh, worked for Banks, collected some of his paintings straight from the Chinese export studios in Canton, um, and some other of his paintings were commissioned on, from painters by his orders, we thought these paintings were confined to a very specific format and paper, so we didn't necessarily look into uh, other formats. But uh, it turns out that the painting in the middle here is actually a format that's supposed to be commissioned spe specifically by Reeves, but actually this composition is not new, although it was credited to Reeves. Um, not in so many words, but it was credited to Reeves. As you can see, um, I found that <laughs> It actually had been extant since the 1790s. Um, it is present in uh, Alexander Duncan's album that he bought uh, in Canton and now kept in Edinburgh. Uh, we don't think this album was necessarily commissioned because it doesn't have very scientific details. It was possibly a purchase from a decorative export painting shop. And as we can see, the composition was also used again in the mid 19th century in Corey's collection. And that's also kept in the Lindsay Library. So, interestingly enough, some of these uh, compositions that we might assume are original to a plant collector and his uh, orders uh, for a commission, well, not might have been from Chinese painters. Um, so that's the first way that we can see the agency of, of Chinese uh, go-betweens in, in uh, in the making of those botanical paintings. Now, there's another thing that's really interesting is that there's a similarity of composition across commissions or purchases of different plant collectors in time that can be attributed to a very specific source, the so-called book of Chinese plants that Joseph Banks was actually lending to his plant collectors. So in 1790s, we know that Alexander Duncan was using a book of Chinese plants that Banks lent him to facilitate his collection of plants. And then in turn, William Kerr borrowed the book from 1803. And then before hiring his own painters um, in 1816, Reeves relied on paintings kept in the East India Company, uh, in the East India House Museum, sorry, Probably that was the same book that Duncan and Kerr had used. So uh, across these three uh, different plant collectors, the book was a learning tool for uh, both the plant collectors and the Chinese printers that they were hiring uh, in, in Canton. So what was that book and where was it coming from? Well, with the other scholars of the Blake project, we believe it is a reasonable hypothesis that the book was in fact composed of paintings from Blake commissions that Banks would have acquired after the latter's death, um, since they were actually working in very similar circles and with Solander and uh, John Ellis. In fact, the book might be the one and the same with a set of simpler Blake commissions stored in the Natural History Museum. Therefore, uh, if that was the case, the model that several generations of Western plant collectors in China used to start their own commissions was made by Maxa, a Chinese artist, with his own skill at adapting both Chinese and Western traditions with observation from nature into these hybrid paintings. And that's a very interesting fact <laughs> that's not often told when we discuss Sino West, at least the Western botanical paintings of Chinese plants. To compound these findings, um, allow me to find to show you one more example of Maxwell's so-called legacy. Um, one of the paintings in the Natural History Museum, which was possibly Banks' book of painting, is a begonia that was painted in the 1770s. 
whose almost exact composition later shows up in an undated and unsigned decorative album from what is called the Lansdowne Collection in the British Museum in something that looks much more decorative and has been stripped from its uh, scientific purposes and a few leaves were added for decorative purposes. So my hypothesis is thus, that the paintings that Maxow made for Blake in a scientific manner in the 1770s were later adapted as patterns by artists in Canton Export Art Studios stripping them of their scientific content to be sold again as decorative albums to Western customers, but in mass production, as in uh, there were multiple copies of those very singular paintings uh, originally from Maxwell. So some of these compositions have since been wrongly attributed to Banks plant collectors, such as Reeves, uh, that were active actually a few decades later in the early 19th century. And all along, Maxwell's legacy had been ignored. So here we can give him back uh, his due in the in the making of Sino-Western botanical uh, history. So as a conclusion, um, I just want to show you that even in the Linnean Society, we can find a copy or a simpler original of a Blake commission, uh, which we haven't really figured out how it, it uh, arrived there, but we know that several other effects of Blake are also kept in the Linnean Society. So that's an interesting fact. And um, yes, uh, I like to I like to hope that I have shown that the case of Blake's Commission botanical paintings can really offer a glimpse into the hidden part that many Chinese go-betweens took in early Sino-Western intellectual exchanges at the margins of empire, and that this paper was a good addition to the rest of the conference. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, as I mentioned before, Joseph is not here. We do actually have uh, Jordan Goodman in the audience, who's been um, really centrally involved with a uh, multi-year project on Blake, um, um, who's worked with Josepha. I'm, uh, we've been trying to uh, figure out how to enable him to join, so I'm not sure if it's been successful at this point. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? It was. Okay, so um, yes, welcome, welcome, Jordan. Thanks. And yeah, I just wanted to invite you to um, uh, field questions if anyone has a question. Um, sure. But maybe we could also, please, if you do have a question about um, about anything that was in Josepha's presentation, uh, feel free to ask in the, in the box. Um, uh, but maybe I could just have you start, Jordan. Is there anything else you'd like to say about about this work? Uh, you know, the other parts of the project that are ongoing now, any new discoveries? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, hear better. Maybe, I wonder if the volume could be slightly louder. Can you hear me now? Um, I can, yes. Okay, yes, let's... yeah, it's coming through fine. Okay, okay great. great. Yeah, this is a project that began uh, about five or six years ago. And we thought, uh, at the time it was confined entirely to the, to the Mellon collection at uh, Oak Spring. But as Josepha made clear, the more we worked on it, the more we came across more drawings in, in really very unexpected places like the Royal College of Physicians. And uh, I want to thank Dominic, who I know was there for giving me the, the little hint that I, I should go to the Royal College of Physicians. There may be something there for me. But the, the really big uh, discovery was this cache of manuscripts, including the Chinese sources that Bradby Blake used in Canton in the library of, of Canterbury Cathedral. And that really completed, if you can ever have historical completion, the sort of material we hoped for. We knew that Blake was using the Chinese Materia Medica manuals, but they weren't in Oak Spring, they weren't in, in the normal places. And how we found it is a, 
a real detective story, but that's really made us able to work out who did what, where, when, because as Josepha said, Blake's early death in Canton in 1773 mm -hmm. didn't bring an end to the project because it was his father with the help of Wang Gatong, who by then was in London, that attempted to complete the work that his son had begun. And we can see that in the Canterbury Cathedral archives, because there you have the writing of the father on the son's annotations. And so it's absolutely fascinating. And Wangatong is obviously the linguistic and more go-between um, between the father and the between the father and the project. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, uh, I, I do realize there uh, we're, <laughs> we're already at time. So I mean, I I, I uh, hate to have brought you brought you on just to speak for a few minutes, but it's truly appreciated, Jordan, to hear this extra context um, and to have some live discussion. Um, so so thank you. Um, uh, unless there are any final questions, I I, I think. I'll encourage us all to sign off now for the lunch break and to return in an hour for panel two.